This video was brought to you by The Daily Briefing. Subscribe for the latest news around the world by clicking the link in the description. The European Union is a complex thing, unlike almost anything else in politics. And because it's unlike anything else in politics, it tends to undergo a lot of change, with leaders from across the political spectrum calling for more of X or less of Y. Macron is perhaps the most vocal of these reformers, regularly coming up with big-picture projects like strategic autonomy or a new European community, including Ukraine and even the UK. However, on Monday, Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who's usually pretty muted on this sort of stuff, decided to give a long speech laying out his vision for Europe. So in this video, we'll take a look at just why Scholz and others think the EU needs reform, what he's specifically calling for, and whether these reforms are actually possible. First things first, why does Scholz's vision matter? Well, put simply, Scholz holds power by virtue of being the leader of Europe's biggest economy. Germany, together with France, has been at the heart of the European project since its inception. The European coal and steel community, the original predecessor to today's European Union, was in large part a French attempt to make further war with Germany impossible by subordinating Germany's industrial base to supranational control. And it was ultimately a Franco-German proposal that led to the creation of a European single currency. Conversely, if either France or Germany say no to a proposal, you're going to find it tough, if not impossible, to get it through. So, as leader of Germany, Scholz's ideas and vision carries weight, especially given that his ideas look pretty similar to Macron's. But before we get into the substance of what Scholz is proposing and planning, we need to have a look at why the EU supposedly needs reform in the first place. Broadly, Scholz and others see three issues with the current setup common defence, enlargement fatigue, and the national veto. Let's take each of these in turn, starting with common defence. The war in Ukraine has shaken Europe to its core, prompting even the most dovish politicians to call for investment into Europe's armies. Sweden and Finland are set to join NATO, and Macron's continuous call for so-called strategic autonomy looks increasingly prescient. Yet, as things stand, the EU's common defence policy is sorely lacking. As we've covered in a number of videos, military affairs remain firmly in the hands of member states, and there's been a lot of resistance to the idea of an EU army. Moving on to enlargement fatigue. The European Union hasn't grown since 2013, when Croatia joined the bloc. In fact, the bloc has actually shrunk with the withdrawal of the United Kingdom. This isn't for lack of demand. Ukraine, Albania, Turkey and Moldova all wish to join the European Union, but the existing member states already have too much on their plate. The past decade, for instance, has seen the sovereign debt crisis nearly break the euro. The refugee crisis threatens Europe's borders, Brexit, the pandemic, intra-EU disputes with Poland and Hungary, and now the war in Ukraine. This has sucked the political energy and will out of the enlargement process. And it's precisely these internal disputes that lead us to the third issue, the national veto. Nowadays, the vast majority of decisions at the European level are taken by Qualified Majority Voting, or QMV. At its core, QMV is basically just a double majority requirement. For a proposal to be accepted, at least 55% of EU member states, representing at least 65% of the EU's population, must back a proposal. Crucially, QMV does not apply to a number of sensitive areas, most notably foreign policy. Instead, decisions taken with regards to the EU's Common Foreign and Security Policy, or CFSP, require unanimity. In other words, if a single member state dissents, the decision fails. This came to a head earlier this year when Hungary said it would be prepared and ready to veto an EU sanctions package on Russia, unless it got a number of concessions. As the decision required unanimity, Hungary got its concessions, allowing the package to pass under unanimity. So there are some issues with how the European Union functions, but what's Schultz's plan to fix them and his vision for Europe? 
Speaking at the Charles University in Prague, Schultz laid out his vision of Europe, noting from the very onset that the centre of Europe is moving eastwards, and the member states must deliver on the promise of peace that formed the core of the bloc by, quote, enabling the European Union to safeguard its security, its independence, and its stability also in the face of challenges from without. To that end, and in an attempt to tackle the common defence issue we mentioned earlier, the German Chancellor proposed a new European air defence system, with him pledging that Germany would make substantial investments in the area in the coming years, and that European neighbours would be invited to participate in the project from the very start. On this issue, Schultz warned the audience that, quote, we have a lot of catching up to do in Europe when it comes to defending ourselves against airborne and space-based threats. While this project is still a long way away from Macron's idea of an EU army, Schultz's proposal is certainly a move in that direction. On the matter of enlargement and the national veto, Schultz signalled that he thought reform was required, arguing that swearing allegiance to the principle of unanimity only works for as long as the pressure to act is low. Clearly, Schultz is considering that major crises like the war in Ukraine require more immediate action, and trying to please everyone will only slow the bloc down. In addition to this, Schultz went on to highlight that the risk of an additional country using its veto and preventing action increases with each additional member state. With multiple countries in various stages of a session, Schultz suggested that the EU gradually move away from unanimity to majority voting in common foreign policy. But interestingly, he also proposed a similar shift in other areas too, notably tax policy. This is a sort of implicit concession. Schultz is basically saying to the more Eurosceptic members, if you let me have majority voting for defence, we can have majority voting for tax issues, which means no more vetoes for the more fiscally conservative member states like Germany. With that in mind, this seems to be a major concession on his part. Schultz argues that if the EU can transition away from unanimity in certain areas, this will create political space for further EU expansion towards the east, allowing countries like Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia to join what he described as the free democratic part of Europe. So, on to the final part of this video. Will these proposals actually happen? Well, while Macron has expressed an interest in similar ideas in the past, any move towards QMV on sensitive areas such as foreign policy and sanctions is likely to be resisted and resisted hard by countries wielding their veto the most, the likes of Poland and Hungary. Hungary in particular has used the unanimous nature of some decisions to force greater and greater concessions, and they won't want to give up on this power anytime soon. If Schultz wants to get his reforms, he'll probably have to offer something significant, most likely on tax issues or debt sharing, to tempt those smaller EU members who worry that majority voting will render them powerless. This concern was even raised recently, with the Polish Prime Minister suggesting the EU was run by a Franco-German oligarchy, and calling for institutional reform, although it's pretty unlikely that the reforms he has in mind line up with Schultz's. All in all, while Schultz's plan does echo that of his French counterpart, something we've covered in a separate video, it's still, for now, unlikely to get off the ground, at least in the near term. We first covered this story on Tuesday, so if you want to stay up to date with the latest global politics, then be sure to subscribe to The Daily Briefing. That's our show where we break down the day's biggest news stories to make sure you never miss a thing, you get insights from around the world, and you understand more than just the headlines. You can watch the show every weekday on the TLDR Daily YouTube channel or listen through your favourite podcast app. Subscribe now by clicking the link in the description and never feel left behind by the news cycle again.